It feels like I've been talking about this book for months, but now it is official. It is time to discuss Lucy Elman's Ducks Newberry Port. By now, you're probably familiar with this 1,000 page chonker of a book that is comprised of a mere handful of sentences and dispenses with most punctuation, including periods, and replaces it with the phrase, the fact that. The fact that it is an interior monologue of an Ohio housewife's at home baking. The fact that it veers off into these weird and crazy tangents as she considers things like Little House on the Prairie, Lucy Maud Montgomery, Harrison Ford movies, open carry guys, styptic sticks, tardigrades, her failings as a daughter, how she's failing as a mother, clickbait titles, fatbergs, and song snippets. The fact that she will spend entire pages musing about creek names or telling us the contents of her freezer. She'll spend a dozen pages or so telling us things that are definite, like there will never be enough butterflies, mayflies, hummingbirds, cardinals, that she will never have to stop buying things like toothpaste, milk, butter, soap, avocados, peppers, baked beans, noodles, rice, cat food, that the Chinese market will fluctuate. If aliens come to earth, they will never stop laughing at our sci-fi movies and that muggers will mug and burglars will burgle and buglers will bugle and adulterers will adulterate. And the fact that there will be a 30 page glossary of abbreviations for your use at the end of the book. In fact, it's hard not to wonder if Elman's just having a go, just throwing bushels of words on the page and hitting submit, doing some next level literary trolling. It's hard not to imagine early readers scratching their collective heads. And in fact, Elman's longtime publisher, Bloomsbury Press, passed on the book, refused to publish it. Hard pass. Um, I mean, how do you even edit something like this? Now, fortunately, a small independent publisher, Daily Beggar Press, did take it on and publish it. They've got a history of doing that. They also published Emer McBride's A Girl's A half Form Thing. Both that book and Duck's Newburyport would go on to win the Goldsmith Prize in their subsequent years. And of course, Duck's Newburyport would also go on to get shortlisted to the booker and enjoy heaps of high praise. So much praise that I'm surprised there hasn't been more of a backlash. I think the only thing that prevents more people from uh, bitching on the book is the fact that it's so intimidating to read. I mean, this isn't something you just whip through so you can perform your hot take. And I get it. You can go into this book and decide these unbroken paragraphs and repeated use of the fact that are simply not for you and nope out of it 100 pages in. But then it's hard to righteously go on about the book when you know the remaining 900 pages are much the same thing. And that Elman must be at some bigger picture, and that's a bigger picture they won't resolve unless you commit to reading the full 1,000 pages. And for those that have read it, well, now you can lord it over those so-called readers that simply do not have the sheer literary endurance that you clearly possess, that you have seen and conquered this bookish Everest. But still, I wonder if I would have enjoyed it as much if not for all of that reassuring validation coming from so many sources. Of course, shortlisted for the booker, but it was also a Time Magazine must read, a New Yorker, Book Ride, Chicago Tribune, best book. I mean, heaps of praise and the list goes on. And yes, I did like it, but that hardly seems like going out on a limb. I will say though, I did like it enough that despite the fact that I was three quarters of the way through the book, having dipped in and out of the book over a course of a few months, when it showed up in my cohort for the BookTube Prize Fiction Awards, I decided it deserved a dedicated read and started over from the beginning and read straight through. And still, really great. So our narrators are a former college teacher, now stay at home housewife with baking as a side hustle. She survived a bout of cancer and instead has accumulated a mountain of medical debt. She's lost her mother, which as far as she's concerned has essentially broke her. Her first marriage has failed, but she's since remarried to a man she absolutely adores and is surrounded by a brood of kids that are too busy for her watching YouTube or dropping toys for her to consistently step on. Still haven't completely sold you, have I? How about this? This whole stream of consciousness deluge of words that can seem like a bit of a gimmick at first does resolve itself to paint a picture of the current world, or at least the current state of the United States post 2016 election, pre 2020, COVID-19, murder hornets, race riots, dumpster fire. It's that disjointed, jumbled mess of information that's always trying to vie for your attention. It's brand names and song snippets and headlines um, that are crowding into our thoughts of our own guilt and trauma, our feelings of inadequacy and resentments, our memories, and then veering off into these tangents 
thinking about the Amish and the abominable snowman and the bee at Breadloaf. Um, it is putting to the page that incessant internal monologue that's going on all the time in our heads, that monkey mind, that meditation is trying to quiet, the stuff the brain throws at you when you're trying to sit there with your eyes closed and clearing your mind of any thoughts. It's like scanning the radio dial and getting snippets of news reports, commercials, and music. I kept thinking about Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Yeah, that movie, I thought it was just okay, but Quentin Tarantino really just geeks out over the media of that era and uses it to great effect to establish a very specific time and place. And it's not just the musical soundtrack. It is all the media, the TV, the commercials, the, the radio, the news reports, the music, even down to the specific sound of the cars. Does a lot of the heavy lifting to establish you in a very specific time and place. It is more than just background noise. It's really doing a lot of work. Elman's doing the same thing on the page as we jump from thought to thought. She is establishing a very specific time and place. We are skimming through these words and sentences and it's creating that background noise, that chatter, that monkey mind. And that's why I don't think this would work as an audiobook because it isn't a straight recitation of words. It doesn't work like that. As background noise, it's more like listening to a podcast at three times speed. I think of the poor audiobook narrator and what a sheer feat of endurance something like this would be. And there are no rules for this. I mean, what is the proper inflection for reciting a list of brand names? Is it this sort of ongoing recitation, a drone of words? So you have joy, crest, tide, palm olive, woolite, or is it the excitement of jumping from word to word and thinking of new brand names like Excedrin, Tylenol, Kleenex, Kotex, Tampex, Altoids? And then there's all the musical snippets used throughout like Figaro, Bushlanapec, Skip to Malu. Do you sing them? Do you say them? I mean, I didn't even recognize half of the musical cues used in the book. Now, thankfully, someone has taken the time to find the musical cues used in the book and provide the accompanying music to them, of course. Anyway, I'll have a link to that page uh, in the links down below. And then there's just all the words, like coelocanths, spiegel im spiegel, nasturtiums, libestrom, autorhinolaryngology, malikalikimaka, dibromochloromethane, trichlorocetic. There needs to be audiobook hazard pay. And then it jumps to a completely different story about a mountain lion using full and complete sentences and punctuations following a mountain lion, because I guess that's what you do. I don't think critics are over exaggerating when they call this the great American novel. It's very specific to a time and place post 2016 election and what it means to be a woman in that time, to be a mother, a daughter, a wife, an object of desire and completely invisible to be out of step with the concerns of her own daughter and that generational gap that seems to be ever widening with the advent of the internet. Elman is contrasting our narrator's experience of making it through the world with that of an idealized past of America typified by Little House on the Prairie and musicals. And in light of our current situation, it's hard not to think how endemic racial structures have always been, how it's always been there at a subconscious level, just underneath the surface. It's been that water that white America has been swimming in. Granted, you can cram a lot into a thousand pages. Regardless, I am grateful for having had the chance to reread this for the book two prize. I'm sad it did not make it into the semifinal round, but there are still a ton of great books still in contention. And I look forward to seeing some of those advance to the next round. In the meantime, I hope you're staying safe, staying sane. We're at the beginning of the June. Who knows what June has in store for our 2020 dystopian bingo card, but I don't know if anyone can be surprised at this point anymore. So. Hopefully, we'll have a chance to talk to you soon again.